Hi, I'm Daniel. And hi, I'm Chris. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the unofficial, unofficial Aesthetic Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to episode 4 of the unofficial Aslick podcast. This is your host Aaron and today I'm joined by Chris and Daniel, the boys from Bishan. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. So maybe we can start off um, and you can tell me more about yourselves. Maybe let's start with Daniel. Hi, okay, I'm Daniel. So just to let you know, I'm 22 years old. I've been a supporter for Home United for about 13 years right now. So the reason initially was because I live in Bishan and they play very close to where I stay. Um, at the same time, it was also convenient to head there to catch the team in action. But what drew my interest at the time was actually when the players, we had our disposal, which delivered entertaining football. Example like Ekma, Indra, Perez, etc. So these people that injected quality into the pitch, it wasn't long before attending matches actually became a weekly affair. Oh, that's great. How about you, Chris? I'm 36, I'm a tutor. I work at, uh, that's what I do for a living. For me, initially, I started off watching the league back there when it started with Sabong Rangers. Basically, back then when they had Taiwan Sweeper and so on and so forth. Then there were some financial issues that actually plagued the club for a few seasons. So when they eventually went downhill, I stopped watching the league completely for more than a decade. So, maybe you're wondering, what made you come back to this local football? Well, I lasted for live football over again after this long decades away from the game. So, I stay in Yishun, so I believe it's very important to support a club that's actually near you geographically. It's a bit like if you were in England and if you live in London, you should be watching more of the clubs in London rather than watching Blackburn for example. So Yishun is basically a bit of dumping ground clubs wise. As we know for Yishun Stadium, different clubs actually stayed there for one season and basically just left. So the nearest will actually be Bishan Stadium, Home United, and that's why I'm here. So as for which player I support, um, even before I watched Aslik all over again, maybe two or three years ago, there was this African guy that caught my attention. You see him all over television, playing for Slack and and so on and so forth. And of course, that's Serena Kamara. And of course, I was actually completely like downcast over Aslik back then. But this guy really caught my attention. Just running up and down the flanks and basically switching from defense to attack in one quick instant. So naturally, if I watched him before I came back, when I came back, obviously he will be a guy for me to actually watch and support. So that's a bit more about me. Okay, so in case you didn't know, Daniel has been supporting Home United for the last 13 years. And for Chris, he actually blogs um, about Home United at homeunited.wordpress.com. If you have the time, go check it out. It's an awesome blog about Home United. Uh, you can find lots of interesting stuff in there. Okay, so moving on to the next part of the program, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about Home United. So last season, the Protectors actually finished fourth and they qualified for the AFC Cup, but that was only based on goal difference. Now, after a 14-year absence, do you think this is finally the year the ASLIC title is returning to Bishan? Well, for me personally, I think it's still too early to actually predict the outcome. Like, I believe every other team also has a shot for the league title. But having said that, we have assembled a decent team this season, and I feel that as long as they are consistent and not let complacency creep in unlike the previous seasons. I don't see why we actually can't challenge for the title this season. Yeah. I concur. If we look back at the club this season and comparing to last season, right, actually there's quite a bit of changes. Just looking at the charity shield itself, right, our breath didn't look quite like what they were last season. Basically they were pure shadow their former self. Whereas the likes of Happiness, they were in constant turmoil for all the wrong reasons regarding money and their chairman and so on and so forth. As for DBMM, I feel that after the ASIC changed their rules to actually cut down the number of foreigners, they were not quite as effective as what they were when they had five foreigners back then. Because if you think about it, Brunei basically is a team of Brunei national team players plus five foreign players. They were really awesome back then. But without their two extra players, we found them somewhat lacking at times. So if we think back about the top tier of Singapore football right now, we can agree that these four clubs probably are going to be among the top contenders. So Home United obviously also went through quite a bit of flux when they actually got rid of Coach Al and had a new coach and we also lost the likes of Kenny also obviously but we made a number of astute signings alongside a number of Singaporean national players so if other clubs show signs of faltering and we can push on, who knows? 
Okay, so speaking about new signings, what do you think of the new signings that Home United has made this season so far? Who has impressed you the most? Uh, I feel that the newcomers they, that they came in, they started slow initially, but I feel also that maybe because they are slowly settling to the team, so hopefully they will come good in the months ahead. Actually, one example I made was Stipe Plazibat. Like, I was highly critical of him at the start of the season, especially after the horrid display at Phnom Penh in Cambodia. But I'm glad that he now knows where the net is, especially for the last two <laughs> matches. <laughs> so, uh, for me, personally, the biggest challenge for him now is whether he can actually bring his goal-scoring instincts to the AFC stage where definitely more eyes will be on him. As for whoever, as for the new signings that actually impressed me the most, definitely Hassan Sani. Definitely. Without a shadow of a doubt. You know, as, given his uh, display against Bruna DPMM, he will have made a difference between a win and a loss easily, you know. Yeah, exactly. But having said that, it's also important for the defence to keep him covered at the same time. Otherwise, he would be in for a long season, that's for sure. Okay, because it's only been three games into the season, a bit more if, if you consider all the AFC games. So I actually find that for different games, different players actually stood out for me. For example, Adam had a great game, a match performance versus the in the AFC game earlier. Whereas Stipe obviously did pretty well in more of the games as well. But if you were to just look back just a few days ago, Hassan definitely saved from either from a defeat. I actually tabulated a bit about the number of shots that Homie actually had to endure against DPMM. Basically, he saved 7 out of 8 shots, which definitely to me qualifies as a great start for him. Now, obviously, it's just been a few games and it's still early days. You need to actually observe further. Yep. And in case you didn't know, right, he was selected for the team of the week in, in our podcast yes, for, yes. for the second week. <laughs> he deserved it fully. Yeah, yes. it was a Spider Man performance in Brunei. Okay, let's go on to the next question. And I think this is pretty hard for you to answer. Yep. Which Home United player is, in your opinion, indispensable to the club? Okay, I would like to start off by saying that no one should be indispensable to the club. I mean, the players who do not perform up to par, they should be replaced, you know. But if you're asking, about, if you're asking me who is the key player for Home United this year, my opinion it has to be Serena Kamara. Okay. I mean, he's a very versatile defensive player and he provides options in attack at the same time despite being a defensive player. Uh, one strong opinion is that he's definitely one of the best defenders we have had since Valerie Hiek. Yeah. Great minds do think alike. I may be a bit biased, but definitely I also think that he's indispensable for the club. A bit about Daniel actually said, no one should be indispensable. But if you take away a number of names, like for example last season, if not Ken also, he wouldn't be anywhere near the AFC spot, let's be honest. So, the likes of Nizam and Paris were actually injured pretty often. So, Ken was definitely the one that we actually needed last season and no one else could be close to him. For this season, he has to be Kamara. Yes. Whether in last season or this season, whether if you're in a left back or as in the centre, he actually did pretty well. Last season, he actually received his share of critics regarding his defensive performances. He did concede a good number of goals, but that's not fully his fault. You have to remember the likes of Abdil was injured for a long time and there's this big flux in keepers when the likes of Zoo and the likes of Heronism and the likes of Echo had a share between the posts. So Hamara really saved our Asprey of the last season. And this season as well, against the weaker teams, the team actually transiting between defense and attack, picking up with Farage Ramley pretty well. And when he needed to actually sit back further like against Brunei, I felt that he did manage to somewhat limit Brunei's effectiveness. Yeah. After all, they're facing against great strikers, yes, Man Man sure. So Hamara, definitely for me and Daniel, will be the indisputable choice this season. So from the players, we're going to move on to the AFC Cup. As you all know that um, Home United lost their first AFC Cup game in Myanmar to Yadanabon. But it's still very early in the competition. How far do you realistically think the protectors will go in the AFC Cup this season? Um, I believe, you know, there's an ongoing stereotype going around that such AFC competitions, that any team who made it through the qualifiers, they are never expected to make it past the group stages. It's been proven with SCFFC back in 2009 and 2010. They have given a good account themselves, but they are just simply not good enough to actually make it beyond the group stage. So, I can say that the same applies for Home United this season. Uh, ha having beaten Phnom Penh in the playoffs, with the loss to Yadanabon definitely not helping our cause. Uh. But 
also to add salt to injury, this year's format only allows for group winners and the best runners up to advance to the knockout stages. So with that, I actually feel that our chances won't be good unless we actually win the remaining three matches. However, having said that, the team shouldn't be feeling the heat at this stage. Uh, because they should just continue to go out and play the normal game, you know, while taking to heart that should they make it past this stage, right? It will actually be a brilliant achievement by itself. For me, I think it's a matter of prioritization. Because as you know, Kumaita is juggling four tournaments this event, this season. So after having lost the first game, they may actually feel that the odds are actually against them and choose to prioritize for the league and the other two local tournaments. But that being said, AFC is actually regional in nature and I do believe that if Coach Idea is looking forward, he will be trying to actually push us towards that direction rather than to actually sit back and admit that fine, AFC is basically half gone and let's just focus locally. Because if we have that kind of very minus kind of mindset, we will actually never progress as a country, as a league or as a club. So, yep, like what Daniel said, losing the first game didn't help at all, but we, based on the pacing in the league, right, and based on where they are playing one or two games per week, I believe my third nature of actually having young players will put us in good stead because as we know young players recover faster and like for example, the whole my third played two games in a row, first locally and then against Brunei. I was actually worried about higher legs and so on and so forth, but somehow he proved me wrong completely. Somehow the players are young and dynamic enough to actually be able to have the kind of quick fit and quick thinking to actually get us the win back in Brunei. So if they can juggle everything well and put everything on equal footing, I don't see why we can't have a good chance of progressing. And like what Daniel has said, our group is in a very awkward spot. But based on the whole premise of actually not counting the so-called bottom two games, there's actually an ego footing in that front. So I think that we do have a little chance if Coach Ideal give the cup emphasis. Okay, so we're going to be looking forward um, at match week three. As you know, this week, the protectors will be sitting out because of the odd team um, number of teams in the league. Well, do you think it's a good or bad thing for Home United? Now, this is taking into consideration that Albirex may actually overtake the Protectors if they beat DPMM. Or even Haogang if they trash, you know, Young Lions by an abysmal scoreline. What are your thoughts? Uh, I'm not worried too much about where they stand after the match day 3 actually. But for me, I feel that it might be bad because if you take a look at the schedule, after our AFC ma match on the 14th, there is the international break which may actually cause a slight disruption to our plans. And after which, we also have to play our next league match on the 1st of April, which is quite a, you know, quite a long time away. You know. uh, we might also need to worry about subsequent fixture congestion, given that we have only played just two league matches this month. But we want to put it in a positive light. It may also be a good thing because it allows ample time for recovery, especially for players who are injured like Chris Van Hoysen. I mean, he's a talented player and our definitely like to see him back sooner rather than later. Yes. Yep, a bit like what Danny has said, this guy is a bit of a double-edged sword. The bad side will be the fact that after winning two games, right, you will feel that we have momentum on our side and we actually do want to keep playing games, especially if we are young and so on and so forth. But that being said, right, if you are actually forced to play this week as well, right, we have another Brunei situation, as in two games in quick succession, and that could actually prove to be pretty fatal. We are travelling and so on and so forth. Like people can actually say that against Brunei, we actually managed to recover in time and we are young and so on and so forth, like what I said earlier. But that being said, we have to remember that Hassan saved Home United, saving 7 out of 8 shots on target. So if the same thing happens again, Lightning will not strike twice. And let's imagine for one second that Home United is playing this weekend and next week on Tuesday. And with all the tired feet and all the fatigued bodies, I really think that it will be like one bridge too far to actually bridge this time around. So I think it's a bit more positive on that end. And that's like what Danny has said just now, right? The placing after three rounds really doesn't mean anything. Even we're looking at bigger leagues like EPL, right? They only really care about the first halfway stage. It's basically completely premature to worry about that right now. Yeah. So we're moving on to the topic of transfers. Um, since it's still early in the season, let's talk about what has happened in the transfer market during the off-season. So apart from Home United, in your opinion, what was the most shrewd or shocking transfer in the off-season? <laughs> this definitely has to be the three Burmese imports for Badassi Kausa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, it, it's shocking because the Tigers have been rather silent during the off-season, you know, with regards to their transfer news. So nobody saw it coming when, you know, uh, it was announced just weeks before the season started that they will be signing three Burmese internationals. I mean, that move took me by surprise. 
I'm sure many others were taken by surprise at the same time. Yeah. But it's a good thing to see that they actually brought in the crowds because of the many years, many seasons playing in front of empty stadiums, which is what uh, Topayo Stadium is actually quite famous for. <laughs> la. <laughs> famous for yeah. Okay, so that is basically Daniel's input regarding the most true or the most interesting signing. But sometimes I think that there's a big difference between being true and being effective. So for them to actually come to Singapore to actually customize the whole new climate, of course there'll be the initial shock element and bring in butts on seats. But that being said, based on what they did on the first game, their impact seems to be minimal at best at this point in time. Sure, there'll be actually support from a lot of foreigners, but they need results to actually keep them in place. So I do have a few set of transfers which I think actually do play quite a big role. I'm not sure whether they're considered shrewd, but I think they are going to be quite effective. For example, the Warriors duo of Bahaki and Shario definitely brought in his fair share of shock when they are sort of effectiveness. Sure, they are veterans and they are seen off a bit of a discard from the Malaysian League, but they bring back some experience both in Aston as well as for the national team. So, if Warriors are trying to reunite their fire this season, they will do worse than to sign these two veterans. Then, beyond that, closer to home United, I feel that when Coach Al brought a bunch of players to Al Club United, the likes of Aza for Al United definitely will play a very big role. In fact, just like a lot of other fans who felt that after Ken and Aza actually left home, United was, was suffer, I really agree with them because they were like, you know, basically our offensive pinnacle last season. So I feel that Aza, who just returned the outcome after a stint back then for Alcock United, will actually play a big role for them. And pardon my length. And but if you were to actually disregard this pair of transfers, personally I feel that maybe the most important transfer will actually be for the Ghana Young Lions. Where they actually coach our young under 21 national team captain, Sharin, for them. And he actually played for them for the first two games and of course we can't say that he did well based on the number of goals they considered, but football is a team game. And let's imagine for one second that they have some green horn pressuring their defence. I dread to imagine what kind of score it will be. Could it be double figures? Could it be rugby? Who knows? Maybe it's him for me. So let's talk about the depth of uh, Home United squad. Do you think Adam Swandi should be given more game time to, to develop his game further at Home United? Uh, definitely. I mean, given the fact that he was once based overseas up until his NS days, you know, he should be. Also, he's SEA Games eligible, so it would be a shame if we sign him just to put him on the bench and let the selectors miss him out because of the basis of having very little playing time. However, having said that, Adam himself would also have to be consistent in his shifts at the same time. So as you mentioned, we do have strength in depth and everyone would be competing for their places. So it is important that Adam do stand out and actually prove himself, prove himself in the matches to come. That's what I feel. Yeah. Okay, that's a great piece from Daniel. Personally, I feel that Home United did lose a number of good midfield players, ranging from Aza to the likes of Amir. So now that Adam is here, he kind of feels a void alongside with like Izin Shafiq, both like national team. The first being like a steward and for Adam being like somewhat of a greenhorn but we all know about his exploits for Mertz in France mm -hmm. for the youth team. So Home United is known to be a club that actually places a big emphasis on our young players. If you look at our squad age from last season and even right now, we are one of the younger squads in the league. Of course, it's counting Garena Young Lions. They are going to be youngest by default. Mm -hmm. So obviously, if you want him to be the next big thing which he has been struggling to prove thus far, Home United probably is the best way for him to actually fulfill his full potential. We have a coach who believes in young players and Coach, um, coach Ideal obviously brings him experience from back from Coach Lee's days and I'm sure that he will be trying to actually merge Coach Lee's uh, should I say endurance alongside his current enterprising style of play to actually mold Adam into a key player for both country and club. So absolutely he should be given a fair chance. Okay, we're going to talk about foreign players um, in the next uh, question. Which foreign players, player or players from any club do you think would have the most impact in the league this season? Well, um, it is still early days, but if you ask me, I feel the combination of Rafael Ramazzotti and Billy Mehmet looks interesting. Mm -hmm. Both are tall and skillful attacking players, and they were just unfortunate to have to face Hassan Sani in, the, <laughs> in their opening match, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, so I actually see them scoring many goals between them, and they will definitely be crucial for Bruna DPMM's run for the league title. Sure, this pair of foreigners 
individually they struck fear into many opposing defences. Now when they have combined, it is indeed quite scary to think about. So I will not elaborate too much regarding the pair of foreign players from Randy PMM. So I will try to actually provide an alternative perspective. So as we actually witnessed for the first two games of Tampa Bay Rovers, let's for one second this regard their misadventure in AFC. Their duo of Ivan and Rutaro actually played pretty well for the charity show. I do remember personally watching their Japanese winger personally tear Alvarez Gar to stretch at times. A pity about the ridiculous penalty, which that itself is another topic all together, which we should not like jump to it too deep for now. Otherwise, this will be like a three-hour talk show, <laughs> <laughs> right? So let's not do that. So if we then beyond that, personally, I have a name that I think is pretty underrated to me. Uh -huh. As any home Islander fan will remember, Yuki Ishigawa played a big role in the current result against Home Islander last season when he came from centre back towards our front. There are not too many players like that who can actually play on both ends of the field, but somehow with his intelligent ball keeping and heading ability, he managed to score the critical goal that conduct Home to defeat. So personally, for me, right, he could be one who is very underrated, but that could play a very important role for Gilang. And if you look at the Gilang United, their signings have been, should I say, Interesting at best. I personally find it very interesting that they let go of Mark Hartman. So I think that's what Ishikawa will have to play a bigger role than maybe he had bargained for. So for me, that would be Ishikawa. Okay, so from the results uh, of our poll, uh, we actually have some votes coming in for who people think would be the champions of the 2017 S League. As you can see, quite a large number. 33% selected Albirex Negata, which is actually of no surprise. In second position, Home United with 20% of the votes. I personally chose Home United. I voted for Home United. And in uh, joint second position is Haugang United. I'm sure that's because the Haugang fans came in and voted for Haugang. <laughs> uh, Tampanese surprisingly only has 13% of the votes. 13, 1, 3. And then we have uh, sporadic votes for Geylang and Warriors as well, which is well below 10%. No votes for Belastia, obviously. No votes for Young Lions. Surprisingly, no votes for Brunei DPMM. So, in your opinion, who do you think would finish as champions of the 2017 S-League season? Uh, <laughs> yeah, those are interesting vote results there. <laughs> okay, it will be very hard to predict, I feel. Uh, Alberax have assembled a new but also capable squad to challenge for the title, in my opinion. I mean, but the same can also be said for Tampines. With their new signings, as Chris has mentioned earlier, they did tear Elbrex into shreds during the community, community shield show on se several occasions. Mm -hmm. However, there are also teams that maintain their core while bringing in new signings to rejuvenate their squads, like DPMM, Home, and even Haukang. So it will be interesting to see which way the league title will actually swing to. You know, with all with about five teams actually having a you know, a viable shot for the title. Yeah. But I can't definitely give you an answer for now. It's still early days. It, but definitely, it will be interesting as the season goes along. Yeah. Just like what Daniel actually said, I feel that the s currently is a bit of a, a, a three-tier situation. Just like for the likes of EPL, there's this elite six or seven club which we think will challenge for titles every single season. And there's a bunch of basically guys who will be in the middle trying to actually finish top of the rest. And there'll be a guys who are trying to actually avoid being the wooden ponies or being relegated. For s actually it's a very similar situation. If you look at the survey results, which I agree to a partial extent, obviously I do respect the hurt mentality and basically the fact that people will work for basically where their heart leads them to. I think that s actually has a current three-tier system. The elite clubs will actually be obviously Home United, Albrex, Tampanese and DBMM. That's why I was actually surprised to see the Brunei club not garnering any single vote there. Then in the middle, the likes of Aukang, Geelang and Warriors can definitely stitch a strong run to actually put forth their credentials. Uh, for that branch, I particularly will watch out for Aukang United. Not only because of their new coach, I'm obviously a bit biased right now, I'm a sentimental man after all. And he did bring along a number of players from Home United whom I knew and loved. So I think that they can actually do quite well for him there, being loyal to Coach Al after all. And Alcan is actually a club but they're not reliant on FAS funding as well. So they were actually able to secure some contracts earlier than any other club. And if you think about it, right, it corresponds to basically a more standard squad. They know they'll be here for at least one season, if not two, and they were able to start training earlier on. And they had no distraction left for example AFC. So I personally wouldn't be surprised if like Alcan really holds a strong challenge for the so-called elite four. But the ball being round, that makes it wonderful, it makes it magical. 
imagine if the Steam Team were winning every single season. That's not very interesting, is it? So my dark horse goes to Akang and Hector, whereas my brain tells me probably one of the four was actually Sokka and Hector. Okay. Very interesting uh, perspective coming from Chris. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the topic of the Golden Boot. Um, of course, everyone is saying right now Stipe is probably in the, the forefront of winning the Golden Boot this season with six goals after two games. That's a hat trick in every game. Do you think he will maintain his fine run to win the Golden Boot at the end of the season? If not, who do you think would give him a run for his money? Uh, first and foremost, let's be real. Four of his six goals came against the Young Lions and he probably wouldn't get another game like that. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's nice to see him back in scoring ways and if he does maintain his form, being Golden Boot winner actually isn't impossible for him. And, but having said that, surely there are other capable forwards who could actually give him a run for his money. Like I've mentioned before, uh, Rafael Ramazzotti, Ramazzotti and Billy Mehmet, especially when Ramazzotti is the Golden Boot winner for last season. Uh, I also wouldn't rule out the Abrex forwards either, just because I've yet to see much of them. Mm-hmm. And so it would definitely be a huge battle for the Golden Boot. I can also name other players who can who are also in for a shot, like let's say Jordan Webb. Okay. We wouldn't know. So yeah, this is interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree that playing the young lions at home for the very first game is the polar opposite of a baptism of fire. <laughs> the complete opposite. Can't get any easier than that. With all due respect to the Garner Young Lions. But that is actually due to how a league is actually formulated putting them against us and Elbrex in the second game so I do feel kind of sorry for them but I'm actually deviating a little here so obviously I do agree that the first two games were not very indicative the first four goals basically like we know against the Young Lions and the next two goals basically one of them being a penalty and as I was actually sharing earlier on if not for Hassan Sani saving our but many times maybe the whole dimension will be completely different so yes six goals but that doesn't count for that much for this current situation. I personally think that when it comes to the Golden Boot situation, it's really a lot more about whether that player is actually the focal point of the club. For example, for likes of Home United, our goals are actually fairly spread out. The likes of Faris Ramli, the likes of Song definitely all help to chip in. So whether Stipe will actually be the focal point remains to be seen. In fact, I think it's quite interesting to note that he actually was positioned in the midfield for a couple of games with Nizam being the front point of the trident. So that being said, he's running in from deep like, pretty often. To me, that's a bit Ken so ish like last season. And Ken and Stevie are actually very different kind of players. Ken is definitely a lot, I wouldn't say quicker, it's trickier. He's a bit like Fox in the box, he'll come and slap you from the back. Whereas Stipe, on the surface, will be more physical and more direct. But surprisingly, he wasn't playing the Shiro kind of role as I would expect him to play. And Nizam is actually playing that role. So I personally think that that's actually Coach Ideal's way of actually fitting both Nizam and basically Stipe. Because you don't have two Shiro's in any club. Unless you're Newcastle United. But I digress. <laughs> so, if you were to actually just look back at the other contenders, like what Danny actually has quoted, we have all the familiar names like Ramazotti, mm-hmm. like Mehmet, uh, Fumia Kogore, the former S player of the year, the likes of Zioni, a former Croatia under 70 captain, and the likes of Webb will definitely all come into contention. And if you actually think back a lot, the likes of Amri being a national number one, definitely he will also be in for a shot. But like I said right now, after three or four games, right, it's not clear which player are actually the focal point of the attacking trident in each club. Once the lines are actually focused and actually we can see the pattern after uh, half a season or so, I suspect that the guys who are on top of the trident will actually be having the best chance to actually score. After all, they'll be the one who are actually like pulling at the defender's feet and so on and so forth. They'll be the one trying to break outside track. So right now, Stipe doesn't belong to that role. So if you were asking me, it will be a strict heart or brain situation. My heart, obviously, will sing on. But my brain tells me that someone who's a bit more forward at Ramadan probably has better chance. Some good points coming from the lads. So, since we're on the topic of the Young Lions, oh, recently there was a few rory online about the re- recent results of the Young Lions uh, having been trashed in two games, letting in 11 goals. And of course, um, there are lots of fans who are calling for, first of all, the head of Visa Raj. Second of all, they are thinking that, you know, why not let's disband the Young Lions, distribute the players, decentralize them to the clubs and make the clubs play at least one under-22 player in every game. Well, what do you think? Could this work for the clubs or do you think the opposite? I think this has been an ongoing topic for many years. I'm not surprised that you asked. So, 
for me, it wouldn't be fair if we look into recent results of the Young Lions to come up with a judgement. Because this because they played title contenders, you know, home and Alvarez in their first two matches, which is just rather unfortunate for them. However, in my opinion, I believe that the Young Lions were set out in 2003 with the intention to attain Singapore's first ever SEA Games gold medal. It's a fair enough ambition, if you ask me. But after all these years, we have only earned ourselves three bronze medals, while other successful nations, save for Malaysia, they have all won goals without even having a centralised squad. I mean, one example I can name is Thailand, who have won you know, two gold medals in a row with relative ease, and all their players are actually plucked from their respective Thai league clubs, you know. So, for me, I feel it is time to reflect on the effectiveness of this sort of centralization, especially if we do not win SEA Games go this year. You know, that's what I feel. Okay, before we can really go and ponder the effectiveness of the Young Lions and their agendas when it comes to winning SEA Games and so on and so forth, I feel that the best young players in the country at a league need to represent in a way the strength of the league and the country as a whole. So, as we, let me digress for one second. As we know for sure, as the SG has been going downhill like recently mm-hmm. and there's no better indicator than the fact that some of the best strikers last season like Behe from Warriors, the likes of Kawata from Alvarez and the likes of Inui all left mm-hmm. and of course that's not forgetting our Ken also. So the left of greener pastures and the replacements are possibly subpar at this point in time. Maybe I don't actually really see any outstanding from uh, even the likes of Stipe had just one game or two to actually really make his stand. So I personally think that we actually missed out of those foreign strikers from last season. And that's the end of my digression. To get back to the current topic, the whole issue about, like what Daniel has said, the whole thing about judging them on two games actually is utterly unfair. And Silver Rush actually has a lot of experience for SAF. So it's unfair to just put him after these two, these two games. It's completely ridiculous. It's actually also reflective of basically the fans and the mentality of this kind of quick win, quick three kind of mentality. That's not how football works. You need time to actually groom a team. Of course, you can argue that they had like more than a decade to really like formulate themselves and so on and so forth. But it's always going to be a bit of a tower between the Young Lions and between the respective uh, SD clubs. It's going to be hard for the SD club to actually give out the young, best young players to the Young Lions. And this whole tussle it's always ongoing, it's not exactly very healthy. So, on the topic about whether we should decentralize the young lions and to actually spread that across the athletic club, this to me smells a lot of how after um, Lion Chow left the Malaysian League and they were actually spread across the athletic, that was kind of seen as kind of a second golden age for the, uh, the league uh, by all the households coming back. But what happened? Initially, the whole effect of pendant really raised the profile. But thereafter, basically, it was the same old slum all over again. Mm-hmm. So I really doubt that doing that would be ideal. But some people were talking about that as a possibility because I personally feel that the clubs are actually all, in a way, they are all not privately run because we are actually all very dependent on subsidy for Tony Board and the FAS. So in a way, we are kind of at the FAS mercy. And that's actually negative this season when the money came in late and everybody was actually really worried about whether the league would actually be even started at all. Mm-hmm. So if you were to see each club, basically just an individual part of the club, of the league, you are in a way a bit like pizza slices. So in a way, if the league were to say that, oh, you guys must actually all take out a couple of young players from Young Lions and you'll be forced to play two or three players, that will actually affect different clubs of different extents. But well, as a home United, we already play many young players, so it will not really affect us. So you, if you were to take a couple of players from the Young Lions, they wouldn't be able to play. But the same players may actually find that they were stuck in teams like Bayer Khausa. Mm-hmm. So it is just a very awkward situation to really judge. So to summarize, we should not throw the hammer in right now. It's actually way too premature. And this whole thing about destroying the Young Lions just before the SEA Games is definitely silly talk. And while people can say that the league has a right to actually disband them and spread them around and kind of in a way dictate these terms, I'm not sure whether this kind of leadership is actually healthy for us. The league is actually going through a state of flux with Lin Chim leaving and with the whole FAS going through a new election. I really doubt that they want to actually throw a stone on their feet and in a way deem the Young Lions a failure. That's not the way to start off their new regime. Hey, some very valid points there by Chris. Um, well, since Home United is not playing in the Yes League this week, uh, let's talk about the next game that they'll be playing and this is right to the AFC Cup where they'll be playing against Tan Kuang Nin. <coughs> 
Uh, this will be played on the 14th of March, which is next Tuesday, and it's a home game at Jalan Besar. Now, Pan Kwong Nin, um, in the Vietnam League 1 so far, they have gathered three wins and two losses. Um, looking at the dangerous players or prominent players that they have in their squad, they actually have a striker from the Republic of Congo. This is uh, Patio Tambue. And also, they have a couple of Vietnamese internationals in the team as well. Um, one of them is the central midfielder and captain, Wu Ming Tuan, and also the striker, Mak Kong Kwan, who was raised in the Czech Republic and uh, even played for Sparta Prague B. So, looking at this, what do you think are Home United's chances against Tang Kwang Ninh uh, next Tuesday? Oh, it is definitely hard to tell. I mean, personally, I've heard of Vietnamese teams like Hanoi TNT and Bekamex Bing Don, but before that, I had never heard of this team. <laughs> <laughs> so, not much is known about them actually, apart from their qualification to the AFC Cup by virtue of being Vietnamese Cup champions. Mm -hmm. But as you know, from every opponent in the AFC Cup, they wouldn't be easy. And I, I really hope that our players will rise to the occasion for this match. So, it will be a tough one to call, you know. They are now, they are now up against Yadanabon as we speak, you know, they are up against Yadanabon. But, I do, I do have... Uh, some confidence that we can actually claim maximum points from this encounter, especially given that it is our home game, it will be a very crucial three points to back. So, yeah, but I can't comment on the strength of <coughs> Trang Quang Ning because <laughs> even the players you've mentioned, I've not seen much of them. You know, their name do resonate with me, but I haven't really seen them in actions to actually make a judgement. But, yeah, I'll be confident with the three points and it should... It must be three points, definitely. Yeah. We cannot afford to slip up much longer, given that there's only three games left in this AFC Cup. Yeah. Okay, so to quote Daniel, he believes that three points are attainable and it's in fact pivotal when it comes to actually furthering Home United's AFC's hopes. I do think that we have a decent chance. And the fact that we just played Brunei like last week actually is a pretty good thing because if you think about it, Brunei actually is full of Brunei national, uh, national players and had a few international players. So in a way, if you compare them towards any of the clubs, they are relatively a lot more international compared to us. And in a way against Brunei, we are in a way playing against a foreign team. And that will in a way make it make the whole notion of playing a foreign team not that alien after all. It's basically yeah. one after another. DMM followed by Tan Min, that's what you have said. So this sense of familiarity is actually going to be in our favour. Of course, if you were to actually think back about the result and how we went about winning it, if Hassan winning us again basically single-handedly, forgive the pun. So you will actually have to be really careful for this game to actually not burn Hassan as much as it did for the game against Brunei. As we mentioned earlier, we are not exactly sure about the strength of Tan Kong Min and even their famous players do not exactly resonate with me. So I do believe that the fact that we just played against a foreign team and the fact that we are relatively well rested will put us in good state. But that being said, the ball is round and my heart and brain sometimes will actually have contradicting views. So my heart definitely hopes that we get the three points to actually give us a good shot at moving on. Whereas my brain tells me that things won't be that simple as it seems. Uh, may I add that, you know, for the game against Yadanabon, I mean, it wasn't that much good of a performance if I were to watch the whole game. Uh, but to give them the benefit of the doubt, we were without key players, you know, uh, some with NS commitment and at the same time we've lost Isdin Shafiq and by watching the game, given that we've lost Isdin Shafiq, you know, we've lost the entire midfield battle and that's why even when we have more forwards like, you know, Stipe and Suto played alongside each other after which Harun Nizam also had a role. But despite that, you know, we couldn't master a threat to the Yadanamon backline because we've totally lost the midfield battle due to such absentees. Uh, things may change as we face this Vietnamese team at our home soil. I believe players will be released and I I really hope that, you know, key midfielders like Isdin Shafiq, they are, they'll all show up and, you know, deli deliver a decent game for all of us to watch. And yeah, with that, I, I'm still confident we can attain all three points. Just, just a quick question for the both of you. Um, as you know, Jalan Besar is an artificial pitch. So there's always this notion that foreign teams that come and play at Jalan Besar usually lose because they are not acclimatised to the pitch. How, how big of a factor do you think this would be in this game? Uh, well, you can, you can use the field you know, to 
uh, to make it to put it in our favor, you know. But one thing you can never discount the Vietnamese is their fight. You know. Agreed. I mean, for us, you know, we may we may have the moral boosting uh, advantage that oh, this is a this is a pitch we are so acclimatized on. We should have an easier game compared to them. But on the other end, I wouldn't believe that the Vietnamese will be thinking the same. I, they wouldn't care if they were playing on sand either. If they want to beat us, they will do all they can to beat us, you know? So, yeah, that is one thing that we should give it to them. It is it's in their blood to actually put up a fighting game, as we can see in the Suzuki Cup and even in their V-League matches and how they have played so far in the AFC competitions. Every match was a fighting performance put up by whichever teams that plays. So, Home United, we have to be careful not to let such kind of complacency creep into us because that's where they were actually capitalised on. on it. Yeah. Okay, that's a good number of points from Daniel. Of course, we can go on and mention many different kind of things. Whether it's the pitch, whether it's the personnel available, whether it is the weather, whether it's the coaches and what they had with dinner yesterday. But my point here is that what he said, it's just one of many factors that can really change things. Obviously, we have the home advantage. We consider Jarama as home for the Bichan based club. <laughs> but Vietnamese will believe that they are here to show their countrymen overseas that they're here to actually do a job. To actually, in a way, inspire them that, hey, we may be here doing a less than glamorous job. But we are here to actually show you that we, so called glamorous football, are here to do a job. So, I believe they'll be up for the fight. So, I really don't think that the field really pose too much of a challenge or benefit for either clubs. And another thing that the field really matters will be the matter of passing play. For home United, I noticed that for the last couple of games, they actually play a lot of passes which are kind of long towards the likes of Faris and link up with Kamara pretty effectively. So artificial pitch, to me personally, doesn't let us well towards the passing game. So if we are going to play this kind of long passes or to actually play towards height, that may be to our advantage. But Vietnam knows all about our pitch and I'm sure they have these pitches back then in Vietnam. Let's not underestimate them. And if Singaporean League and football has digressed, definitely Vietnam League actually improved it and bounce. So let's not have this kind of very mild people that wow, we have this pitch and we are going to win. That would be very foolhardy. So let's not kid ourselves. Very good points, very good points. Okay, so let's move on from the AFC Cup and S League to one tier down, which is the National Football League or the NFL. Um, based on recent reports, FAS is planning to provide incentives such as a single season title sponsor for the NFL competition, and this is cash, and also insurance for the players. Well, this is, um, of course, pretty controversial because it comes at a time where FAS is planning to announce the elections. So what do you think about this? Uh, what are your thoughts on the whole fiasco? I believe this move is long overdue <laughs> because... <laughs> For, for a long time, NFL players have always been known to be the forgotten ones, you know. But yeah, it is a good initiative to finally provide the players and clubs, you know, with some form of incentives and assurance to continue playing the sport they love at their level. As I do feel that, you know, it's not fair to simply cast them aside just because they are not S-League teams, you know, just because they are not uh, prof a professional league to begin with. But yeah, as you mentioned, you know, I do hope that these initiatives that come would actually benefit the NFL in the long run. I certainly do not wish to see this as a one-off, I mean, just because the FES elections are coming, you know. Uh, also, I would like to add on that, you know, it would be a nice touch if we were to invite a couple or maybe a few of these clubs to compete in the Singapore Cup, mm -hmm. for example. We have seen how, you know, in countries like England, clubs like Sutton United made a fairy tale of their own, you know by competing against Arsenal despite the fact that they are at the fifth level of English football. So it would be a nice touch and it would definitely be beautiful, you know, to have a fairy tale of our own rather than constantly inviting teams from the foreign leagues to actually compete with us in our competition. So that's my opinion. Sir. Let's have our own fairy tale. Yeah. A good fairy tale indeed. A simple analogy here. If someone would offer you $100 and say no one would be the worst for it and no one would suffer for it, you will take it regardless of like you know where it came from. Likewise, we may actually be controversial and claim that this kind of thing is just to actually pepper over cracks and to actually make the regime look good. But the thing is that this is like what Daniel said is long overdue. So whether it's part of an agenda or whether it's actually really heartfelt, let's just put our dumpling cells behind for one second and just accept good things as they come. And even the ethnic players are not exactly particularly well paid, let alone NFL players. A lot of them are actually like normal digital professionals who are actually rushing down for training and to actually play the game that they love. 
if for example the average ASIC player earns for example 3 to 4k every single month whereas the NFL player just earn mere allowances the fact that they are not covered under a proper insurance scheme is completely laughable of course we can say that this is not the ASIC being not a professional league of course ASIC being professional is completely debatable so now for them to actually get this kind of uniform coverage regardless of reason regardless of agenda or not I think it's long overdue and like what Daniel actually has said if you can actually replace some of the clubs competing in cups by the clubs in NFL based on their competency and their level of interest that can be interesting but obviously that may also result in some gross mismatches if Sutton was trash 20 near by Arsenal we wouldn't be saying what we have just said so everything comes with both sides of the spectrum both sides of the coin so we actually must be careful what we actually ask for like Arsenal Arsene Wenger actually said that his team had a 1-2% to chance of actually beating Bayern Munich to actually progress in the Champions League and of course we all know what had happened I'm sure he wished that he didn't say that but he can't undo it so hopefully now that the FA has said they want to provide this kind of incentive for the clubs they better say, leave it and not swallow it back otherwise the world will remember Okay, so um, the next question is something that I'm actually going to ask every guest that comes on the show because I really want to hear what people think about this what suggestions do you have to improve on the 19 league structure? Do you think we should continue or should we change the structure altogether? I think this can be a continuation to the point of the Young Lions, actually. So, just yesterday, Haokang coach Philip Au mentioned that maybe we should, we should get uh, other defunct local clubs back in, such as Woodlands, Gomba and Tanjung Baga, uh, should the Young Lions six cease to exist. Mm -hmm. So, I do concur with coach Au's point. As if we all remember when Tanjung Pagar United made their return to the S League back in 2011, it was kind of filled with many players who were at the age of 18, you know. Uh, example like Dewinder Singh and Shamil Sharif, just to name a few, and both of them are actually still active in football right now, playing for Hong United and Home United respectively. So they didn't perform well that season, I mean, they were all 18 years old, but what they did accomplish for themselves and especially for the league was to widen the talent pool and this was actually proven when coach Reddy Avramovich selected Delwinder Singh and Patrick Paran to the national team to sort of you know provide them some playing time at the international level hence I believe that you know this could be a viable alternative to improve on the 19 league structure especially when you know currently there are only six teams vying for AFC competitions and there are two spots for us so Every season, one third of the local teams have a, have a chance to play in the AFC. That is a total mismatch if you compare it with Malaysia, for example, you know, where they have more teams and two spots and everyone is actually eligible for, or for the AFC spot. So, yeah, I feel that we, we do need to increase the number of teams. I think that's, that's quite important. Okay, some good points regarding increasing number of teams. But obviously, as we know, we can go about and claim that we are Bill Gates and we own Microsoft and so on and so forth. Who will pay for the clubs? Who will actually fund the clubs the way that Uncle Joe did for the Bench Rovers? We can't find another deal anywhere in Singapore right now. So, it's easy to, for us to actually claim that nine teams is odd number. is really awkward. I will know because I'm not playing this weekend. So, for if you look at... Uh, you look at the, all the international leagues in the world, right? No good league will actually have an odd number of teams because you mean that teams are actually sitting out and that will lead to all kinds of inconsistencies. So, of course, we're looking for a solution for a problem, but it's just that, for example, Africa has actually a lot of family issues. How are we going to solve that? Who will fund this kind of funding methods and provide solutions? It's easy to actually say that we can invite so and so to come and join, but ultimately, it's just about the financial issues. So if you look back at potential entrance towards the league, of course people will think back about the usual suspects. Whether it's Hanjo Baga, whether it's Samoan Rangers or Willis Wellington. But these clubs all left or become defunct because of financial mismanagement or because of various ethnic feelings. So for us to just pluck someone to throw into the league simply wouldn't work. I think we should look at the current NFL infrastructure to actually introduce a promotion relegation system whereby obviously as the name suggests, the best club will actually come and take over the worst club. Of course then you think about Young Lions being in the NFL instantly but perhaps if they are going to stay they need some kind of immunity a bit like for example I forgot the team but when this, this plane crashed in Brazil the entire club was actually not uh, given um, a pledge they were not regulated for 3 seasons so it's something like that for whoever comes up whether it's Young Lions or whether it's any of the NFL clubs my understanding is that one or two of them 
are actually doing pretty well at their level and perhaps want to need that, make, make that push. Obviously, funding will can't be exactly the same as any other estate club. After all, they are not as established. They need that initial buffer payment. You know, you look at EPL, right? Clubs will get regulated, get what they call buffer payment for the next three seasons. Maybe, for example, the NFL Chamber will get promoted. We need to have that for the first three seasons to actually ensure that they actually have a bit more longevity to survive. After all, a league that is always chopping and changing and having less of issues still being a dumping ground simply wouldn't work if we are trying to actually raise our profile. That simply will not work. So, for me, it's all about regulation and promotion. But obviously, if we go to that topic, regulating a club comes with dire consequences. But that being said, looking at the current aesthetic situation, maybe certain clubs wouldn't mind getting regulated and starting over again. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my opinion. Okay. Fantastic stuff, fantastic stuff. Okay. So, moving on to the... Uh, actually, this is... We're almost at the end of the program. Um, we're going to move on to part-time pundits. Um, if you've been following our podcast, you will know that this is the time that all of us would give our predictions on the scores of the upcoming games. Um, incidentally, this week I have two Home United fans here, but unfortunately Home United is not playing. <laughs> so they'll be predicting the scores for all the other games. Um, me, myself, I've already given my predictions in episode 3. So today, Chris and Daniel will be giving their predictions. So just a round up, quick round up of the matches that are happening this weekend. Um, on the first, uh, the first match that's coming up will be on the 9th of March, Thursday. Albirex Negata against Brunei DPMM playing at Jurong East. On Friday, Warriors against Geylang at Chua Chu Kang. And on Saturday, Haogang will play Young Lions at Haogang Stadium. And Balestia will play Tampanese at Tua Payo. Okay, so perhaps we can start with Daniel. You can give us your predictions um, for the Albirex and Brunei game first. Uh, I do expect a high scoring game for this one actually. Okay. Uh, I'll predict a 2 all draw. 2 all draw. Yeah. Okay. How about you, Chris? I feel that Albrex didn't start off as well as they did last season. Yeah, they actually basically were all guns blazing. That is for DBMM, right? As we actually seen for the game against Home United, they were not able to capitalize on the chance that they actually created. So to me, Albrex may have actually come from the back of a win, whereas Bruna actually came from the back of a loss, but I don't think either team look as good as they were last season. So I suspect there'll be some neutralizing like what they never suspected. Mm -hmm. But for me, right, when two teams are not feeling at all of their game, I don't think that they will be scoring a lot of goals. Instead, I think they will tend to be a bit more defensive and sit back and try to hit back on the counter. Mm -hmm. So I'm going for 1-1 one, one draw. 1-1 one, one draw? Oh, interesting result. Okay, the next game is uh, Warriors against Geylang at Chua Chu Kang. Daniel, your thoughts? I'm actually predicting another draw on the cards for this one. Okay. Uh, a one or draw. 1-0 draw. Yeah. Okay. How about you, Chris? To me, this is actually a pretty interesting game because Warriors and Geylang were two fallen giants of the league, mm -hmm. if you can actually term them like that. Mm -hmm. And to me, when I look at Warriors, right, instantly, the last Shari Ishak, Bahaiki, and Webb will jump up. Whereas when I look at Geylang United, Gabriel Quack, Yuki Ishigawa, and Shawa Anwar will definitely jump up at me for the players to watch. So, I think both teams have their fair share of match winners. And they are not, they may not exactly be at the level of, for example, Ken Yuso last season, but definitely people can score. So, I personally felt a bit that's very surprising, like I said earlier, that Geylang actually let go of Mark Hartman mm -hmm. and Warriors actually let go of Becher. So whether it's due to financial issues, as they went to actually more Federal League side, the Malaysian League, or whether it's due to probably technical reasons, we will not know. But as we know, the league tend to have its hand tight financially. So with the top scorers of last season gone and being replaced by a bunch of veterans, known as they are, I once again think there'll be some nullifying here. And I'm going for a 2 to draw. Basically, the complete opposite as the earlier game. So, okay. so far, we have a 1-draw and 2-to-draw. And that's <laughs> reverse <laughs> orders. Okay. Yeah, so from the northwest of Singapore, we are going to move to the northeast Haukang Stadium, where Haukang is going to be playing Young Lions. Is it going to be another trashing? What do you think? Um, yeah, I expect an easy win for this. Uh, my prediction will be Haukang to go out 3 new winners. 3-0. Okay, as I mentioned earlier on, I'm actually thinking Alkang is a dark horse for this season. So a dark horse to me is not that far from basically the so-called group of Elite 4 as I mentioned earlier on. So when any of these 5 players get the Young Lions, unfortunately there cannot be a massacre. Mm -hmm. I once again feel sorry for the likes of Heine and the likes of Sharin, but I think that it will be once again be the likes of a final trashing. 5-0, okay. Uh, so those of you who are buying any other score, please take note. <laughs> okay, next one will be the last uh, game of the, the week that's happening on Saturday. Ballastier against Tampanese at Topayo. Uh, for me, I feel that Tampanese Rovers will, want, will be determined to get back on track. I mean, after the humiliation in Bacalot City. So, I'm taking a 2-0 Tampanese victory for this one. Okay. 
Okay, here's where I think I have a different opinion. As we know, the Bayesia Khalsa actually had a very interesting thing when it comes to their choice of foreign players and their chance are actually roundly applauded by their nationals and their stadium and they actually gather more than 1,000 entrants for their stadium to scatter off for this club based in Topayo. And as for bad, Tampanese Rovers, of course we can argue that a fine new game was an anomaly but they were actually playing below par or they had some unfortunate results. But I think the whole ills that actually afflicting Tampanese began way before this where they actually mentioned last season that they were actually capping the salaries and where they actually had an outflux of players, for example, Hafiz Suzak to, to tie Blik 2, they actually lost a number of players. Obviously, Pennon was also a loss, but his loss to me is more symbolic, as in showing us that they cannot actually afford him and they overstretched for him. To me, it reminds me a lot of when Blackburn actually had a new Indian owner and they said, oh, let's sign Rodinho, you know, let's raise our profile, but they couldn't pay for it. In a way, they paid for their works with relegation. And for Tampanese Rovers, obviously relegation is not on the cards, but I feel that this issue alongside the likes of the money issue, which actually continued to actually bother them, and the fact that they were not very professional when it comes to choosing their um, choice of shirt providers. So basically, there's a whole lot of things that actually is hindering Tampanese at this moment. So I personally think that there'll be an upset on the cards here. I'm going for 1-4, best year, also. 1-0? Yeah. Okay, that's good. Okay, so this is the last part of the program where we are going to ask you a few questions. Um, we're going to be posing five questions to the both of you. All the five questions are related to Home United. Okay, so the last time the Ultra Eagles came on the show, they managed to get five out of five. So oh, let's see how impressive. well let's see how well the protectors will do this time. I'm around. definitely under pressure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first question. I think it's easy. I think you'll get this right. Where did Home United play their home games before they shifted to Bishan Stadium and what was their name back then? To be specific, 1996. When they were still Police United? Police FC? is correct. Police, Police FC, FC is correct, okay. And the stadium was? Jalan Besar. Jalan Besar, okay, good. One point. Second question. Ekma. <laughs> Remember Ekma? Okay, Ekma was um, actually he played for um, Home United from 96 to 2007. 11 years, 238 goals for Home United. Now, he was also made a Singaporean under the foreign talent scheme. How many caps did he uh, earn for Singapore? Oh, oh it's tough. It's, it's tough. really tough. Yeah, it's really tough. Uh, <laughs> this will be a guess. Anything. It's okay. 24? 24. Okay. Close. Um, he had 15 caps. Yeah, that's not close. <laughs> <laughs> that's not close. <laughs> Thanks for the sympathy. <laughs> yeah, he, he had 15 caps and he scored 4 goals. Um, just a fun fact, when, when Egmar played uh, in the first season for Home United, he was joined by fellow Brazilians. So it was a uh, samba flavour in, in Jala Besar. The other Brazilians were Fabio da Silva, Joao Batista, Joao, Joao Batista and the goalkeeper was Sergio Cleveland. I think Sergio Cleveland played a few uh, seasons for Home United as well. Okay, You're next one. <laughs> uh, that's way too long ago. It's okay. We even born. <laughs> <laughs> were you even born seriously? You were, right? Yeah, 96. Were. You were a few years old. Yeah, I was just drink cradle. Three years old. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, next question. About Kamara. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> Which two ethnic clubs did defender Serena Kamara play before joining the Protectors in 2013? Etoile and Young Lions. Yeah, oh, really easy one. Okay, so that's two points. Okay, question number four is... Our Singapore captain, Sharil Ishak. Okay, Sharil Ishak has the most Singapore caps. Uh, currently, he's joined, uh, he has the most caps joined with Daniel Bennett, 132 caps. When did he play for Home United? What was the period? 2007 to 2010, if I'm not wrong. Yes, you are correct. You are absolutely right. That's fantastic. So, nice. Sharil actually played uh, 2007 to 2010 and then he left the team for Percy Bandung when we were still challenging for the title yes he, he <laughs> left he left five games before the end of the season unfortunately yeah he went to Percy Bandung and you will never uh, forget <laughs> oh, <Not> forget. Never. <laughs> so he he made uh, 98 appearances he scored 42 goals for the protectors okay so you have uh, three points out of four so for the last question okay is uh, regarding about the marquee signing one of Home United's marquee signings in recent years was former South Korea international Lee Kwan Woo. What were the nicknames given to this eminent midfielder? Sirius. Sirius is one. Do you know the other one? 
Anyway, I'll give you one point. This is just for the fun of it. I wasn't even home at the back then. <laughs> <laughs> I can't answer any question other than the Sakura Kamara question. <laughs> you took it away from me. How could you anymore? <laughs> yeah. You want to make a guess? Uh, no, but if you're going to give me the answer, I'll probably say, oh, I, I should have thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, actually, the answer is Kwan Kelme. Like with Kelme? Okay. Oh. So, yeah. Yeah, I heard. You heard about <laughs> it, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Okay. So anyway, talking about Lee Kuan Yew, 2013 was a fantastic year for Home United because that was the year you won the Aesthetic Player of the Year. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew won it. Kamara won the Aesthetic Young Player of the Year, and Coach Lee Lim Seng actually won the Coach of the Year as well. Home United was second in the league behind Tampines Rovers that season. That is the bad thing. <laughs> that, that was the that was the downside that of the downside of it. If not anything, I mean, we won the cup. We could have won the double. We could have swept everything, but. You got yeah, that's football, that's, yeah football. that's football. I mean, for me, the most heartbreaking one was still 2011, where we were a point away from the title, and I, I was watching them all season. We have the title designing game against Tampines Rovers, and all we needed was actually a draw, and then to win our final game against Geelang to be crowned champions. But we lost in the second half. I mean, we lost one nil, courtesy of an Ahmad Latif goal, and to me, that was more hurtful. I mean. Even in 2007, when we lost the title by one point to SAF, it was hurtful, but I didn't watch most of the season to actually feel for it. But in 2011, it was the year we just returned to Bishan from Clementi, and so I watched almost every game that season, and even attended training sessions, you know. So it was, it was one, of the, you know, one of the most bitter moments as a supporter to lose out the title by one point. But yeah, so in mid... It sort of like made a eight year wait become a fourteen year wait now. Uh. So yeah, it's gonna it's gonna haunt me until we, we eventually win the title, that's for sure. Yeah. So hopefully <laughs> uh, young man. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully Home United, you know, um, wins the title this season. They seem to be on track. Let's let's hope for the best. Yeah, may the best team win. Yep, may the best team win. Okay, so that's all the time we have for this edition of the podcast. Um, we'll see you soon again next week and uh, we would like to thank the protectors for coming all the way down to Cafe Football today. Thanks for having us. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you.